I have to tell you guys something. I'm selling the truck today. If you want to go into the factory low that you've always done, this one goes forward. That is normal low. If it ever goes in neutral, nothing, nothing moves. And there it goes. Very bittersweet, but oh, I'll miss it. Yes, it is true the Toyota pickup is officially sold and I know I'm gonna have some questions asking why I decided to sell that truck and the most simple way I can put it is that I was just over it. That's it. I've built the truck, I've had my fun with it, it was time to move on to new things and I wanna give all my focus into one project. That one project is the Land Cruiser. I've known the person who bought the truck my entire life. He's a very good friend of mine. His name is Joel and he's been in the Toyota game forever, for long before me. If you go back on my channel, eight years ago there's a video called Stock Toyotas Off-Roading. I'm in my very first Toyota, a first gen 4Runner, and he's in his third gen pickup. And ever since then he's wanted a built Toyota, so I'm very happy I could finally give him what he's wanted for so long. I should also mention that he helped me do a lot of the straight axle swap on the truck, so his hand hands have built quite a bit of that truck. So I'm glad to give it to someone who helped with the project and helped get the truck to what it is today. So Joel, I hope you have fun with it. Let's hop into this engine rebuild. All right guys, the plan today is to get the bottom end torn apart. In the last video, at the very end of it, I asked, what would you do? Would you tear all these pistons out and just re-ring it and put new bearings in there? Or would you leave it as is? The reason why I asked is because the cross hatching is still very visible in these cylinders and they look great. Plus this motor tested at 185 PSI before I pulled it. The main reason I'm tearing it apart is because I noticed that I have a small crack in my block right here. And this is actually a very common thing with these early 1FZs. And the crack, you can't really see it on camera, but it goes down to about right there. It's a hairline crack. And in order for the machine shop to stitch this, they need the bottom end torn apart. So it's kind of a blessing in disguise, I guess, because now I get to rebuild the entire bottom end and then I'll have that leak area fixed as well. So I'm gonna start tearing this thing apart. I have to take off all of this front area here. So the water pump, timing cover, crank pulley, power steering pump. I already loosened this bolt when it was in the car. Well, I tightened it when I was turning the motor, but that bolt's loose. I knew I wouldn't be able to loosen it on the stand, so I did it in the vehicle. Um, I'm gonna have to remove the oil cooler, the knock sensors, um, the oil pan, and then start taking the bottom end out of this thing. I picked up these new 100 tooth ratchets and I'm obsessed with how they sound. Just the most satisfying thing in the world.
Let's see what we got in the oil pan. A little bit of aluminum right there. This could be from the timing chain or maybe that valve cover grommet that I broke. Um, we got a little bit of, I don't know, looks like a silicone or something in there. But that's about it, pretty clean in the oil pan. Granted, I did flip the motor over so it could have fallen in there if there was any other debris or anything. As far as the upper oil pan, we got a little bit of uh, debris in the strainer right there. Looks like silicone or something. This looks like a twig. <laughs> This might be hardened plastic from the timing chain guide, um, but pretty clean. And now we gotta get the upper oil pan off. I know I keep saying it in every video of this series, but I'm going to say it again. I can't imagine doing this in the vehicle, and I'm so glad that I decided to remove the engine. Not only can I go through the whole thing and refresh it, but I also don't have to do all of this on my back under the cruiser. What you're looking at here is how far you have to tear down the 1FZ to replace the timing chain guides. Hopefully, if it didn't make sense already, it makes sense now why I pulled this thing out of the Land Cruiser to do this job. Imagine taking off those upper and lower pans. As you saw, they took quite the beating. Hammering up this way is a lot easier when it's outside of the vehicle. Imagine being under it and trying to pry this thing off you guys saw how much beating those things took. Imagine trying to do that under the vehicle with all the suspension in your way and then having to work around everything to get the cylinder head off. Uh, it's probably doable. It's just a torture that I'm not willing to uh, sustain. So I took the motor out of the vehicle. It's a lot easier this way. Another thing I wanted to talk about before moving forward is this crack in the block. So you can't even really see it on camera. I'll, I'll show you what it looks like under a macro lens right now. Um, this is apparently very common on early 1FZs, but can happen to all 1FZs, according to the forum board, I Hate Mud. There's an ongoing forum thread with a ton of people, I'll show that on the screen right now, who have the same issue, same spot. It's at 12 o'clock right now, but it would be at 6 o'clock if the block were flipped right side over. All on the same freeze plug next to the block drain. So many people in that thread have the same issue. And there's not really a way to fix it. You can't weld cast iron. The one way you can fix it is stitching pins. And that's what I'm gonna try to have the machine shop do as they're decking the block and resurfacing the head. So anyway, I just wanted to explain what the issue was with that crack. So now we have to get the timing cover off. That's really easy. This bolt is already loose. That would be a lot harder if I didn't do it beforehand. Um, so we just have to pull the crank pulley off, water pump, and then start taking off the timing cover. And then once that is off, we can start pulling out the bottom end and send these things off to the machine shop. The reason why I took this off now is because taking this off in the engine bay or even once the timing covers off the engine is gonna be really hard because there's those really tight Phillips head bolts as you saw. They're actually JIS, but the reason why everyone strips them is because we're using American bits on uh, Japanese screw heads. But this is a very popular gasket that goes bad on these motors. Um, that you can buy from uh, Wits End. They sell a full kit to replace this, this O-ring right here. You gotta love when every single bolt is a different size and then you gotta make a cardboard template to make sure you don't lose everything. I don't know why they love to do that. There's little slots in the timing cover for prying right here. At least that's what they look like, hopefully. So this thing should come off. All the bolts look like they're loose. There's another little slot over here for prying. Really tight to the front right here. Maybe there's some bolts holding it down. 
There was one more bolt hiding right there. I knew I missed something. This is exactly why I never force things off. We got a little bit of the timing chain guide that fell out from behind that cover. I was wondering if we would find that thing down there. It's probably been sitting there for the last, I don't know, 30,000 miles or so. So we should be able to pull out the timing chain now. Should just slip right out of here. And then I can start pulling out these guides. All right, it also looks like there's a number of O-rings that go behind that timing chain cover. So there's a bigger one right here, there's a smaller one right here, and there's actually one on the bottom right here that goes to the oil pan too. So I need to make sure that my head gasket kit came with these, which I'm pretty sure that it did, and take these off before it goes to the machine shop. And then there's an oil squirter right here. I might leave that in place. And then this drive gear should come off of the actual bushing that it's riding in. Should. I'm gonna put my hand under it just in case anything falls out. Okay, and this brass bushing in here is gonna get destroyed when this thing goes in to get hot tanked at the shop. So I have to make sure that when I get this block back, this is still there. Um, if they end up destroying it, they can usually make a new one. And then there's an orifice on top of the block right here too that I'm gonna have to check once I get the block back from the shop. Other than that, I think I'm ready to start pulling out the pistons, rods, and crankshaft. All right, so one of the things that you normally check here is the thrust clearance between your rod and crankshaft, and that essentially just means how much this thing wobbles back and forth. Um, I'm gonna have the machine shop check that, but what I can do before I hand this off to them to just give them a little bit of assistance, I like to help where I can, is I can actually plastic gauge and make sure the bearings are in spec and just hand them those numbers when I give them the block. So I'm gonna do that for all six rods, just check what the clearance is, and then just go ahead and pop these uh, rods and pistons out and pull off this crankshaft. Plastic gauge is not the most accurate method of finding these clearances and it only gives you a general idea, but it is a quick way to see if the bearings fall into the allowed clearance specified by the FSM, which they did. And this is actually the method that they recommend that you do in the manual. All the crank and rod clearances were right in the middle of where they were supposed to be and that's just something I wanted to provide to the machine shop. They're going to line hone the block and size the rods if necessary anyway, but the added info can't hurt and I'd rather take the time to do this than do nothing at all. Now I have to do the same thing for the remaining five rods, pop the pistons out and do the seven crank journals. This takes a lot of time because you're removing the caps, cleaning the surfaces, laying down your plastic gauge, retorquing everything, then removing the caps again to check those clearances. And of course you're double and triple checking what you're looking at so that takes time too. As mentioned before though, everything was in spec with no issues. The bottom end is torn apart and I am happy to report that all bearings are in perfect spec for this engine. The main bearings and the rod bearings are in perfect spec according to this service manual right here. Not to mention that the bearings in this motor are just in such good condition. It's so impressive for 230,000 miles. There's no pitting, there's no scratching, there's no marring. They probably could have stayed in there for another 200,000 miles, honestly. So. Yeah, I need to replace them since I'm here, but could I have left them in the motor with no issues? I'm gonna say highly likely. Could have left them in there and would have not had any problems with it. 
As far as the crankshaft, all the journals look really good and all of these uh, bearings were in spec too for the main bearings. We're gonna be replacing those too since we're already here of course, but this is another thing. I could have just left it in there and I'm sure I would have been totally fine. So as you can see, the cylinder head that was right here is already gone as well as all the valve train that was over there. I dropped those off at the machine shop today and then I'll be dropping off the block next week to get this thing honed for the cylinders and you know, a hot tank, you need to give this thing a bath and to get the, the deck resurfaced as well. But that's gonna wrap up today's video, guys. Thank you for following along throughout this bottom end teardown. If you're interested in seeing more Land Cruiser content, especially rebuilding this motor, make sure that you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss when I post new videos, and I'll catch you guys on the next one. Later.